the shadow, <laughs> you know, it kind of struck me later um, how conscious that was. Um, that, um, you know, there's this voice that's telling you, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not allowing you to do things. I mean, it's trying to make you do things in a willful manner, you know. And uh, so to, um, in, in this wonderful thing, uh, exercise, you put a pair of mar marine boots outside your door where the, uh, the shadow can stay. I mean, that's just, that was a beautiful uh, image, I thought. And it actually, to me, is, uh, is kind of uh, the idea of objectifying <laughs> or personifying the objective, which is the shadow. Here's his boots, and they're outside the door. I need to do this not in a willful manner, you know. Uh, and here you go. And then, you know, personify the objective. You're going to go outside. I'm going to be in here. You know, and it also reminds me of... Uh, when, when Jung was uh, uh, doing his active imaginations, uh, this voice, he says, what am I doing here? Is this science or is this art? You know, and this voice said to him, this is art. And uh, Jung uh, protested that because of the fact that, I mean, what he saw in it was a spiritual process, you know, not a... Uh, a that this was an aesthetic process. So anyway, I just wanted to re-mention that, Tim. Did you have anything more to add to that? Because it's just beautiful, and it didn't strike me until after I re-listened to it. How, how wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was, that was a clever approach, too. Um, and it's not very often that I find something that is that, is that uh, workable in a in the in a real life situation What's, I mean, the this drill sergeant that i was talking about was so adamant and so critical finally i was able to realize okay i really need that in my life but i need it in a different place and so the boots kind of you know presented themselves as an as a kind of obvious choice and now looking back at it i kind of have the same feeling you do wow that was that was really a wise move well, yeah, and it was all, all, it was a very symbolic move too, because you're actually recognizing the reality of the uh, of the um, of this force in you, which has its own um, you know uh, own uh, force. And you know, we're going to today start on the. Right. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, we're going to start on well, the. Uh, uh, did you have something to add, Tim? Well, just just to say that it it had a profound effect on the rest of my life. You know, just being able to, to put the shadow in the place where it could be helpful, freed up all this energy. Part, part of it was the energy of defending against it, and part of it is the energy going into the shadow. Mm -hmm. the, you know, all this drill sergeant energy that was already there, I just redirected it and everybody wins, you know. It was, it's a tool. To me, that, that was what really struck me, is that it was a tool in really, if you're taking this seriously, uh, I mean, what Young's doing, you know, is this inner dialogue stuff. It really is a tool um, to, uh, I think, that could have helped uh, Anna Marjula, too, mm -hmm. <laughs> is what I was kind of thinking, you know. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, here's, uh, I just wanted to read a little bit before, just do a couple things before we go into Anna Marjula. Um, and and this this is what Emma Young had to say about uh, the, um, uh, uh, about the, the spiritual process of integrating the shadow, integrating the anima, and trying to, uh, I mean, in, in other words, you're going to uh, what what a uh, I think this is a, a beautiful thing, and you know, I, I guess you know the thing. I'm I, my focus has always been, you know, on um, uh, especially. I I think I've started um, uh, it. It, it would, the best thing that ever happened me to me was to stop analysis, 
you know, because when I stopped analysis, then I had to, uh, uh, you know, do something on my own. And what I di- I'm doing on my own basically is, um, is uh, to do a uh, inner dialogue with, uh, you know, the, the contents of uh, my dreams and stuff so that I can, uh, um, and so I kind of always sort of say that this, this is my idea of young and so, okay. Uh, here we, and this is from Peter Kingsley in Catafalque. Uh, and if you, uh, this is a wonderful book. I mean, it really is close to the Red Book, but it says, here we have Jung's own statement of what psychology is, as well as why it matters so much. It's the art or science of listening, learning to listen to the voice of God speaking in the human soul. You know, and this, um, this God, of course, is not, Yahweh or a Christian God, or, uh, you know, it is, it is the, is the personal divine, uh, which is accompanying you, company is within you and accompanying you on your, uh, on your ontological, or is part of your ontological purposes, you know, to, um, to be the vehicle for this voice. And that's what I'm kind of learning in my active imaginations too, is to listen to that voice. And what is that voice? How does, how does that voice express itself? Cause it's, you know, uh, what I'm, I'm kind of seeing what, um, uh, of course, you know, I don't know what other people do, but you know, I'm kind of seeing what, uh, Barbara Hanna said that, you know, it, you'll be writing along and this, uh, you know, you're asked, uh, she does it through writing dialogue. I do it a little bit through both. Uh, but she says you'll be ask a question and then you answer the question and she and she says the answers after you do it enough you find out that's not me right answering but she says every once in a while there's a sudden deepening you know so so the voice is is the quality of the voice that i've seen the only time it seemed to really manifest is when i kind of black out for a second you know and one of the things that happened this week when I was doing it and blacked out is I was holding a cup of water and the great mother or Sophia dipped her finger in it, you know, and pulled it out. So, I mean, in other words, she was saying that I dip my finger in the water of your awareness. You know, in other words, that she, the idea is to make, is to lend your consciousness to these figures. The one, for instance, you put the boots outside um, the, the door to, you know, but uh, whatever um, figures that you're, you're going to uh, uh, do, you lend them your awareness so they can speak. I mean, that was what Jung uh, says in the Red Book. Where are you? Where are you, my soul? You know, and then he's, he, he, found out that she didn't, she had trouble speaking. So he says, use my voice, you know, and uh, then she was able to speak, you know. But anyway, I thought right before we start, uh, and feel free to jump in. Did you have something to say, Charles, or you look pregnant with questions? Oh, no. (laughs) I'm I'm all right right now. Okay, all right, all right. I thought you were just about ready to say something. But just feel free to, this is... uh, uh, well, what I wanted to to kind of do is to just do one little introduction, and then we'll just jump into uh, uh, to Anna Marjula. And you know, at first I thought that we just read, um, you know, the the active dialogues uh, that she does with the Great Mother and stuff. But I don't think you can do that. There is it. This it, it it's very concise, and you gain a lot from her narrative. And it's not really very. Um, it's very, it's, it's really short, but before we went into this, I, I just wanted to, uh, give a little, uh, thing about the, uh, uh, about the animus here. This, this is from, uh, animus and anima in fairy tales by Marie Louise von Franz. And, you know, I read this, uh, little fairy tale and it was so, um, close to, uh, oh wait, Miles is coming. Okay, I fell asleep at the switch again, Miles. I have to be more careful. 
Are you there? Okay. Yeah, well, anyway, um, Miles is here. But anyway, um, so here, here's the little, now, now the thing is, you're gonna find that this little fairy tale here almost exactly mirrors uh, the individuation process of Anna Marjola. Wait till you see this, this is amazing. It, you, you won't get it at first, but it'll come up later. But anyway. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, yeah, great. Um, I Sorry, I didn't see it right away. I'll keep an eye on this. Okay, okay. Um, in, in this Northern uh, German fairy tale, a king had a daughter. He, the king makes a glass mountain, a mountain of glass. And he says that only a suitor or a man who could walk across this mountain could have his daughter. Along comes a man who loves her and wants to marry her. The princess wants to walk over the glass mountain with him. So they start out together. But before long, the mountain opens and the girl falls into it. And then it closes up again. So she was the one trapped, not the suitor. Inside the glass mountain is an old man with a beard 17 inches long. He asks her to be his maid. He calls her uh, Mrs. Mansrot or Mansred. So actually he's saying she's his wife. And he tells, his name is Red Knight, or Rink Rank means Red Knight, and tells her to call him Old Rink Rank, or ne uh, Red Knight. Every day he disappears through a small window, where he reaches, which he reaches by a ladder, and every night he returns with silver and gold, which he piles up. Oop, sorry. Anyway, that, um, the, uh, so he's a robber. <laughs> One day she tries to escape. She pulls the window down on Rink Rink's beard, keeping him fastened there until he agrees to let her have the ladder. The ascent. <laughs> That's what the animus provides. She returns to the king who goes and kills old Rink Rank, taking all his gold and silver. And then the princess marries the man who had asked for her in the beginning. So anyway, uh, just just a quick uh, little uh, amplification of that. You know, the the collective attitude, which is the king, creates a glass trap, not for the daughter but for the suitors, to prevent the new thing that uh, might replace him. You know, which is the princess and her prince and their uh, progeny. That's what's going to replace the old king. So he, de he, he helps with the left hand and, and hampers with the right, is what they say. You know, so um, then, uh, so what's missing in the dream? The queen, there's no mother. Anna Marjula didn't have a mother either. The queen had died. So the feeling or the eros aspect of the dominant ruling attitude has died. So there is no feeling function. You know, the animus is all about the thinking function, while the feminine is more intuition, sensation, and feeling. So there's, this is lacking. Eros is lacking. So uh, the weight of the story is on the feminine, but that's on the daughter. Only she, only the daughter, can renew the kingdom and restore its um, uh, feeling attitude. And the glass trap is the king's mother substitute, but it's made out of glass. You know, it's not very warm. And, and you know, a mountain is a mother goddess. And it's, uh, uh, it's a, a point, of, but it also represents a self. It's a point of orientation on the plane. And you, uh, you climb up, climbing up the mountain implies obtaining consciousness. You know, but interesting for us puers, who are on top of mountains, it's all, also all the water of life runs away from the top of the mountain. So, uh, you know, the, your connection to life is, is far away when you're on top of the mountain, you know, uh, but you're closer to the spirit, you know. So uh, the, the mountain is a heap of stones uh, that was thrown in up into the upper world by the lower world, but it's also an obstacle to the ego. You know, it's, it's, it's this thing that we don't want this on the plane. We have to go around it or go over it, you know. Uh, 
So uh, then the girl, it, it, the daughter is caught in a mountain of glass. Now the uh, glass is what cuts things. It, it, you can see through glass, but it is, um, it is um, also cuts off feeling, you know, and cuts off emotion. You know, I had this uh, a dream right before my mother died that they'd taken a tree from the front yard uprooted it and took it and put it in the backyard. Uh, the, the street that runs in front of the house is the flow of life and the backyard is where there is no uh, flow of life anymore. But the only way you could see this tree was through a plane of glass. So, you know, the, the, you know it, it's like a glass wall went between us. There's no feeling of, of transfer. So, this, so the feeling function is now trapped inside the mountain you know, uh, uh, behind this, this kind of barrier for all feeling and emotion. So uh, th then the, so the king is trying to cut off feeling. He wants to stop life so there will be no future king to replace him. You know, and uh, you, that's what I, I say. You can compare that with the poer too, you know, that, uh, the, um, that he's, uh, he's cut off, he's, uh, he's he's living life tangentially, um, so uh, and and you know there's an interesting uh, when when Young was doing analysis with Tony Wolf. Um, this is in the protocols, which hopefully are going to be published in, uh, soon. Um, he, he discharged her, but then he had this dream. I mean, he had developed a, a you know a somewhat of a transference is a <laughs> polite word to say. Uh, to to her, and um, he had a dream that the Kabiri, you know, these are these under uh, underworld uh, dwarves, who, by the way, wear pointed caps, and a pointed cap means that they long for the light of consciousness. These beings under in the underworld had picked up uh, Tony Wolf, the singing dwarves, and they were going to take her into the mountain, and she'd never be seen again. So then he knew that he couldn't break off his relationship with her. So, I mean, there's, there's something about uh, this uh, woman uh, trapped in the mountain. So the king's trap backfired. The daughter um, who wanted to help the suitor, but she herself falls in the glass trap. And um, uh, th this is what uh, uh, von Franz says, only when a man wants to marry her, does she fall into the father complex? Well, this is what we're going to find about Anna Marjula. Is only when a man wants to marry her, does she fall into the father complex? And so then when she falls in, she finds the old man uh, with the beard who, who doesn't, uh, uh, you know, who's apparently a robber. Now, what's the deal with the beard? You know, um, it's, it is, um, all hair on our head re represents um, uh, our unconscious thoughts. And you can think of Samson and Delilah, you know, how did Delilah take away Samson's strength? She cuts off his hair, you know, because what, what does the male have? What's his weapon? You know, it is his, his thoughts, you know, he's thinking function man, you know, I mean, they, he names himself homo sapiens, you know, <laughs> thinking man. You know, but that's probably not what a woman would have named uh, the species, you know. Um, so, and, and it, she, and Von Franz says, the beard represents the terrific flow of unconscious talk. Now, isn't that in interesting? That's what the animus uh, is, is, is this, this terrific flow of unconscious talk that's constantly critical of, of, the um, the ego, and uh, that's what it, it, possession is, and um, so um, it. I, what, how does she stop it? Now, now that, I, I was just interesting. This is my own thought, but you know, wh where's another uh, terrific flow of unconscious talk? The Protestant Church. <laughs> just saying. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it is, it's cut off from the feeling world. You know, I mean, that was the whole idea of leaving 
the Catholic Church and and you know concentrating on the on the actual script uh, the writings of the of the and being a literalist about the the Bible and getting rid of all rituals and and all um, things that connected you to the deep source you know I mean it, it's this it's somewhat animus like. Um, and and the so the only way to overcome this terrific flow of unconscious talk, and we'll find this out with Anna Marjula, is to pin it down. You know, so she shuts his beard in the window. You know, and uh, the window of awareness. You know, she she's pinning his um, thoughts in her window of awareness. So. Uh, by that, she's saying, do I really believe what you're saying? You know, so you sh and uh, von Franz says, women can't fight the animus by killing it. Only by pinning it down can they escape it. So she turns him into a helpless servant where he, and this is the role of the animus. He's not, he is a servant. He's a, he's a guide to the, uh, to the other world. Uh, and uh, he provides her the way out of this, um, she fell in, uh, the mountain also represents the mother. So she falls into the mother who she's lost. She doesn't have a mother. There's no feeling function in the, in the kingdom. And so she's basically um, the one that's going to lift the enchantment of no feeling function. She falls into the mother and the king made it a glass, even though it is the mother, because he doesn't like her feeling function either. This is where she'll be reborn. But how does she get out? Uh, how does she get, how do you get out of trapped in the mother complex? You need um, a spirit. You need a, a spirit that is not um, of, of the earth. That's got a little more ethereal, which is a ladder. It's a connection to the upper world. And that's what the uh, rink rank has, you know, is a ladder. So, and, and a ladder is a meaning and a connection to the upper world. And so uh, now she can come out and then she, um, you know, is uh, uh, essentially, um, that's the individuation process for her, for the princess. So anyway, that's a, how's that for an introduction? <laughs> Okay, so let's get into it and uh, uh, feel free to jump in here because, I mean, I, I think, you, you know what is really interesting about this whole um, thing is that you, uh, you, we're going to learn pretty much everything about Jungian psychology. We're going to learn about, about the animus, we're going to learn about the great mother, we're going to learn about the self, we're going to learn about the shadow, we're going to learn about... Um, how our um, how, how how our life is a divine drama, you know. I mean uh, that uh, you know this um, thing. I uh, that uh, you know as above, so below. <laughs> you know, I mean that's it's really true. And and you know, I didn't really know what that meant, and until you know, you look at life as a divine drama, and at that point. You know, you can kind of, of see uh, this thing happening. Let's see here. Which is you see the people in the uh, lower part of the frame. Um, um, the the, the, the uh, Eros and Logos are represented and they're doing something in of alchemical uh, an alchemical uh, act active imagination and meditation in the lower world and they're providing the heat of feeling the feeling function they're cooking it they're brooding it brooding the images that they get it happens in the upper world and you know I, that's what i'm, I'm asking my uh, you, you know myself is um you know kingsley says that what young taught us what psychology was it's the science of listening to the voice of god within ourselves you know and then i'm doing this active imaginations and i'm saying what is this voice you know i mean and uh it is this um it's this um you know the great mother dipping her finger in your 
in your awareness, you know, and, uh, you know, she's, um, there's another image of her uh, crossing from the, that I had, you know, this was this sudden deepening, which lasts, I don't know, a half second, but you just see this thing fairly clear. Uh, this radiant gold woman uh, clad in brown uh, earth colors is passing from, and she's dual, She's passing from the left, which is the unconscious, to the right, which is, you know, the ego. So she's passing from the unconscious to the ego. So she's becoming, um, the whole idea is to make these figures conscious in your attitude. And really, and this is what I tell them all the time, just, I, I think I'm sincere, you know, I, I just say, I, you know, I'm devoting my life to you. I'm giving everything I have to you, you know, and this is my, the rest, the goal for my rest of my life is to be um, your attendant, at least as far as my awareness and listening is concerned, you know. So uh, anyway, um, that, that's the idea of this divine drama of, uh, uh, that, um, that Anna Marjula uh, really is living and it's it's a wonderful because you know I kind of wrote down the timeline too I I just you know had it here it's a, it's an amazing timeline I mean she she had her great vision at 21 she went into Freudian anal analysis at 22 uh, I, within a couple of years she must have you know uh, developed this uh, this um, you know uh, transference to her uh, analyst who had a counter transference, but wouldn't admit it, but he rejects her. So then for 11 years, she's in stasis. And, you know, tell me about it. I had that happen myself. You know, that's what they say, uh, <laughs> you know, love, uh, uh, being disappointed in love either leads to bitterness or wisdom. And you'll find in pretty much in, in Marjula's life, it led to bitterness. You know, so for then 11 years, from 22 to 33, uh, she, uh, it took her that long to, to, to get over this, this being rejected in love. And then from 33 to 51, 18 years, she really did no analysis. She did her music. She sort of works on her career. And then at 51, she goes into young analysis. And so that's how it starts here. Uh, but anyway, I mean, we can start with this one. Um, thing um, I here. just wanted to comment on. Yes, yeah, certainly. I thought it was interesting that um, there was that old man wanted to be referred to as the Red Knight when in the Parsifal myth, there is also a Red Knight that has to yes. be dispatched with. And um, yeah, I just remember, uh, who was it? Um, yeah, Robert Johnson saying um, that um, I. I I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting coincidence, and in that um, that uh, that freed up a lot of energy uh, when that um, when the, you know the Red Knight is dealt with. And um, yeah, no, I just thought that was an interesting coincidence. Well, that, it is. It, there that, isn't that really a coincidence. Figure is in both myths. Yeah, it isn't really a coincidence to some extent because red represents the color of blood. It. Re it rec represents the color of passion, represents the color of, um, you know, valentines and hearts and everything else. It's the color of, of love, of, of, of real love and passion. You know, even though Rink ranks a robber and a scoundrel, at least he, he does, he's the representative of passion in the uh, male disconnected passion in the side the glass mountain. You know, and, and in alchemy, you know, the two colors are green and red. Uh, of uh, Green is, is the blood of plants, chlorophyll, chlorophyll. Red is the color of animals. And, and Jung said that you can never, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of people want to stop in whiteness. You know, they want to stop in the light, you know. And uh, he says, he quotes the Emerald Tablet, its strength is perfected when it returns to the earth. You know, this is what Hermes Trismegistus says, that, uh, you know, you need whiteness 
but then it needs to return to the blood and needs to return to the body. You know, so it, 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 it you not aren't getting anywhere in whiteness. I mean, this is one of the beautiful things about Jungian psychology is it doesn't forget the body. It doesn't forget the life of nature. It's connected to the rooted world, you know, uh, like unlike any other. And, and, and of course, it's not really inventing this. This is a, this is really a return to the ancient myth of the hunter gatherers of Europe, I think. I mean, I think it's a really a restoration of the organic re religion of, of Europe, you know, so yeah, uh, it was rediscovered by Jung. Yeah. Right, right. I was, I saw some quote somewhere uh, uh, from Jung saying um, that, uh, I don't know, something like he's not interested in making anything new. He's just reviving what um, reviving it was lost. really old. Yeah, yeah. It was lost. Uh, and, and there's nothing against um, Christianity at all. It's, it's, it was a very important. But um, the, the problem with Christianity uh, was, was, it was, a, it was it, it's not really a problem because the one thing it did was evolve um, us out of out of uh, the age of the of bulls and 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 sacrifice, you know, and it took us into a world that's disconnected from the body and nature. But this is the ascent into whiteness. We needed it. Plus, you know, it 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 removed us from the brute nature of of life. You know, with its its emphasis on agape love and uh, unconditional love, and and you know, got away from the, uh, uh, you know, it's the answer to Job, basically, you know, and and it's the incarnation of the divine in life. Although they didn't, uh, you know, the incarnated God, it uh, it it really never transferred uh, like it did in some of the Gnostic religions i mean the the no it god incarnated once in jesus christ and it's not going to happen anywhere else you know so i mean that was kind of their uh, attitude towards that but uh anyway let, let me make sure i got these things in order but uh we'll just start going through them but um again you know this will take a few sessions but it's it's pretty short but i i'm just saying we're going to learn a lot let me see I, that was a, kind of a long introduction but whatever <laughs> Let me see if I can. Get I'll just that. jump in. Yes, um, something that you're sparked. You, mm -hmm. The um, mention of Christianity and how it fits into this mm -hmm. by by coincidence. This is just prior to coming on to this Zoom conference here that we're having. I was listening to a replay of Professor John Verveke, who mm -hmm. is always talking about the uh, meaning crisis and. One of the things that jumped out at me and I noted is he says that John Verveke and his Meaning Crisis Project and, the com and his company, let's say, the people that are working with him, they're not trying to create a new religion or dismantle existing religions such as Christianity. But what he's uh, trying to work with, there are new communities of practice and he also believes that current religions, such as you would say Christianity, will not be, in his opinion, the source of solution to the meaning crisis, but they do, however, inspire individuals to transform themselves and their wisdom institutions such as the wisdom institution of Christianity. And so I'm thinking, for example, that um, Tim has produced his Return the Nails sculpture. Uh, that's an individual piece of work that is transformative to other individuals, such as myself, to really think about what that symbol means to me and how I need to change 
and thereby um, as an individual who has been in Christianity, I'm now like, okay, there's some real things that I feel um, I have misread in the Bible. And now I'm going to take those misreadings and tell other people and say, you know, your perspective on Christianity, what you taught me was this, but I now see it as something meaning uh, something quite different. Um, anyway, rather pedantic, I guess, but um, I invite you to comment on that. So in summary, these religious uh, wisdom institutions will change individuals who will in, then change um, those institutions. Well, do you want to say something, Tim? Well, you know what I would say about it is, is, is what are we doing here? We are a community of people who are trying to uh, uh, find meaning, you know, at least I am, you know. But I really think that I can't, uh, that Jung said, thank God I'm not a Jungian. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea was that if there was someone outside of Jung personally that had done Jung, his images would not help that Jung. In other words, other people's images are not going to help us find our meaning. You know, I mean, this is, this is the idea of, uh, this is the absolute message of the Grail quest, you know, is that, um, that, uh, you know, that they, you go into the forest at the, at the uh, place which you yourself have chosen, where there's no other way or path, because if you follow someone else's footsteps, you'll go altogether astray. I don't know whether I don't agree that you, what you what one one thing that you said was that someone else's symbols are not necessary for or you, you know you can't use someone else's symbols. Oh, you can um, use them. You, you can okay. use them, but I mean the the whole idea with those is. I think the point is that every age has to find their own symbol. Mm -hmm. Every every person in every age has to come up with their own image that works because as time evolves um, the mystery unfolds in a way that that only the individuals present can really uh, encounter and so we are all charged with coming up with our own symbols yeah and I think could we s agree that the symbols um, are you know, just actually, uh, everybody is going to borrow from previous symbols and, and, and the symbols that exist around us. So like your sculpture consists of the mother of Christ. She's a symbol. And you've combined it with the symbol of those spikes and the symbol of a hand pushing them out at somebody. Um, so you, you've taken existing symbols and rearranged them. And so I have to do the same. Is what is that what we're saying? Well, the images I'm saying, I think, this is my hypothesis, the images all come from the same source. So like we read the story of Rink Rank, and I say, you're going to find a lot in this fairy tale of Rink Rank that Anna Marjula discovers in her own life. Because, uh, you know, the idea is the source of the images is the same. But if you're talking about a real living transformation, you're, you're talking about something somewhat similar, at least psychically, to a butterfly in the, a caterpillar that goes into the cocoon, becomes completely liquid with no form whatsoever, and then transforms into a, another being, a butterfly and is reborn. Now this is the psychic aspect of that. I mean it's not going to happen to you physically but the idea is the only way that the that the caterpillar can become a chrysalis and then become a a uh, a butterfly is through it, its 
the the images that speak to Tim and speak to John Verveke and speak to C.G. Young and speak to Anna Marjula and speak to uh, the princess and Rank Rank are the in, is the same voice that speaks to you. So that's what Young says, or Peter Kingsley says that for Young psychology, his saying is that psychology is is the art of listening to uh, or, 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 or giving voice to and making aware in our own awareness by um, uh, our, our own uh, inner voice that's always there. And you have to realize it's living. Uh, how can I be its servant, you know, in, in, by listening to it? And then at that point, I have a chance of, of being my little caterpillar self turning into something else or transforming. But I can only do it through my own images. I can't do it through anyone else's images. And so thank God I'm not a Craigian or a Jungian or whatever, you know. I mean, the idea is that uh, this is, this is um, you know, it takes 20 minutes a day. You know, Jung said, he, he, he would tell people, you know, you know, you need to set a, a aside a little bit of time each day for your own soul. And he says, they laugh in my face. You know, but the, the idea is if you could just spend 20 or 30 minutes a day uh, talking to uh, the wisdom that shaped your body, uh, you're going to, something's going to happen. It per starts to percolate. You know, it doesn't happen immediately, you know, and, you know, uh, uh, it, it takes a while to get it going. But anyway, I would say, uh, yeah, that I'm, I, um, I agree with John Verveke. That um, it's it's going to be an, an interesting uh, little um, experiment of what what happens. So anyway, th uh, this is the first uh, paragraph. I, 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 you know, I was going to skip some of these, but you know, they're just they're all important. I think you know. And here's her little foreword. She says, "In the following pages, and she's she's sort of summing it up after she's already done it, put it into form." You know, she says, in the following pages, I have attempted to describe the gradual development of indi the individuation process, the process of becoming undivided, the process of, of the, there being balance between the inner world uh, uh, that's living in you and your ego consciousness. That's what undivided means. The pro development of the individuation process in my own life. I chose lectures as the form in which to shape my case material, because this gave me the opportunity of objectifying the patient, me, you know, and enabled me to identify myself with the imaginary lecturer. So it creates distance from yourself. It creates, you know, putting your, the boots of your shadow outside your door is creating distance from that voice within you that is interrupting your, um, uh, non-willful productions you know active imagination according to the method developed by cg young and its healing effect on my neurosis are particularly emphasized in this essay i wish to express my thanks to the following people who have helped me miss barbara hannah dr myrtle Elise von franz uh marion baines and miss mary elliott uh, she didn't mention um uh her two analysts, which who were Tony Wolf and uh, Barb and Emma Young, uh, but they, uh, I think they may have been gone by that time. You know, uh, I'm not exactly sure when she did this, but anyway, um, that's the start of it. And uh, uh, let's just get get into it. I mean, she tells her story at the beginning, and you know, I was going to skip this part, but I just don't think we can. It's just too good, you know, uh, to uh, and there's too much in it to skip. Okay, let's see if we got this. I got to make sure I got this in order. Let's see. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. There we go. Let's see here. There we go. So, 
Okay, this is it. I'm pretty sure this should be page seven. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it, I you don't have to just listen to me if anybody else wants to read. But does anybody else want you want to read it, Charles, or not? Sure. Yeah. I'll no, go ahead and okay. Read it. okay. <clears throat> These lectures are meant to demonstrate the positive result which a certain patient obtained through her genuine attempt to make conscious and assimilate shadowy parts of her psyche, parts that have been forgotten, repressed, or that have never been known to her. And, what is more essential, to show the healing influence which she experienced by means of her intentional and active content with the archetypal background of all human life the contact with some of the great unconscious for forces which are contained in the collective eternal source of life and which nourish, activate, and influence all movements of mankind in lesser waves of every individual in his or her daily life. The form chosen by the patient for her attempt at such contact was what Jung calls active imagination. She first tried to let unconscious impulses express themselves in drawings and afterwards she had a great number of conversations with several figures of the unconscious. Since her case of neurosis was an obstinate one and since she had tried various kinds of treatment before she came to Professor Young. It may be worthwhile to look at a series of these conversations and drawings which in the end brought her the peace of mind which she had sought and striven for during what was actually a lifetime. To begin with, an introductory or introduction to her outer history and her case of neurosis will be necessary. A summary of her dialogues with archetypal figures will follow, and we shall try to pursue the growing influence which these dialogues had on the patient and as a consequence on the healing process in her soul. Finally, we shall look at a selection of pictures of archetypal subjects. Although these were drawn before the conversation took place, they could only be interpreted at a much later date. So they will be dealt with in part two of these lectures. Yeah, well that's, um, I think the one thing we're gonna dis discover, at least I discovered reading this is, um, I'm very deeply moved by all of this. It's she lived lived even though she lived a very um, artistic life, she lived a very painful life, and uh, and she is so honest about it. And not only is she honest about it, but so is the great mother. I mean, and her the figure she's dealing with. Uh, so um, let's just go to the next part here. This is I hope yeah page eight. Did, did you want to read that, Tim, or not? You don't have to. Sure. The patient was born in Europe toward the end of the last century, which I assume is the 19th century. Yes. Her father was a lawyer. The family consisted of father, mother, two girls, and one boy. The patient was the second daughter. She was a wide awake child, had an aptitude for schoolwork, and was especially gifted in music and poetry. When she was 13, she lost her mother. When she was 20, her brother died, then several years later, her sister committed, committed suicide. Her father's death occurred when she was 47. Thus, she was left as the only surviving member of the family. Such in brief is her family history. She remained unmarried and took up music as a profession. Her inner history was very much influenced by the father's domineering character, which brought about a negative father complex and by the mother's early death. The patient had been a nervous child, suffering from sleeplessness and lack of appetite. When she was still very young, her be behavior was that of an introvert. She made up poetry and composed tunes, usually in the laboratory. These treasures she showed to nobody except to her dolls. She was, however, full of life, quite a happy child, good at sports and games, and popular with her little comrades. It was a terrible blow to the girl when her dearly loved mother died. It prevented her character from develop, developing harmoniously. She grew precocious in her inner world and extremely shy in the outer world, especially with boys. Boys caused her panic and in return did not like her, which hurt her pride terribly. 
She became neurotic, but nobody seemed to notice this. All the anguish and inferiority feelings due to her shyness were shut up inside of herself as a thing to be kept secret. She felt very much ashamed of this inferiority and tried to compensate it with achievements at school and in music. She strove with all her might always to be the best pupil, and she always was the best pupil. Her ambition grew in an unfortunate way, yet notwithstanding the fact that her mother's death was a fatal event for her in girlhood, the outbreak of neurosis was still somehow held back in her for a period of eight years. However, when she was 21, the breakdown came. It was heralded by her having a vision which later turned out to be the focal point of her neurosis. You know, there's something to be said for the oral tradition. You know, these, it sounds much different to my uh, awareness to hear, hear it out loud. Well, Miles, you get to read The Great Vision if you want. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, this is, this is, I think, where we'll, we'll start to uh, get into a little discussion. Did you want to read that, Miles, or not? You have your, uh, you got to unmute yourself. I'll unmute you. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. I unmuted right. you. Uh, the great vision. Am I sounding okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, very good. Pardon me, I just need a quick drink of water. Okay. At the time when the patient had this vision, which was so important to her, she was preparing for her examination as a concert pianist. Ambition had forced her to work too hard and to overestimate the importance of success or failure in the examinations. Exceedingly eager for artistic triumph and terribly afraid of spoiling her chances of success by stage fright, she had worked herself into a condition of extreme nervous tension. On the night before the examination, the unconscious flooded her and produced the just mentioned great vision or annunciation, which is as follows. A voice told her to sacrifice ambition during her examination by being willing and ready to accept failure or success equally. After a hard inward struggle, the patient earnestly promised to obey this command. Then her willingness to suffer a possible defeat brought her a kind of religious ecstasy. In that ecstasy, the voice revealed to her that it was not her vocation in life to become a famous person herself. Her real vocation was to become the mother of a man of genius. In order to be able to fulfill this vocation, she would have to sacrifice her normal wishes concerning love and marriage and look out for somebody suited to be the father of a genius. With this man, she was to conceive a child in a coitus totally devoid of lust. If she could succeed in having no sensations at all during the conception, and only if that condition could be fulfilled, then her child would prove to be the genius she was called upon to bring forth. Should the father happen to be a married man, she would have to overcome her prejudices and bear an illegitimate child. To the girl, this message was full of manna. She felt it to be sacred. It was a religious experience, a command which had to be obeyed and which could never be set aside and forgotten. It turned out to be the crisis in her life with which it was very difficult to come to terms. We shall have to dwell at length on this inner event because it meant so much to her. Her past life and the future met, so to speak, in this culminating point. For this vision did not originate out of nothing. It was prepared for by events in her childhood and early girlhood and by developments in her character, which together... No, get, I'll let you finish the sentence here if I can find the next page here. 
Let's see here. I should make this a little better. Okay, so we're one. So we've read uh, one, two, three. So this, I'm hoping this is the right one. Okay. Okay, that was together, and then you could just finish the sentence. Had, together had blocked a normal unfolding of her sexuality. Because of all of this, the commanding voice that spoke so loudly in the Annunciation had ever been fed in the con unconscious. Its power grew to gigantic proportions until it was able to flood the ego in that night before the examination, for the ego was enfeebled just then by far too much nervous tension. The first yeah, reaction, to, ahead, do you want me to stop? No, just go to the Freudian analysis. Okay, no, the there. first, very good. The first reactions of the girl to her vision were wonderful. As long as the ecstasy lasted, she lived on a higher level than any she had ever experienced before. She passed her examination brilliantly and her shyness totally disappeared. She felt very happy, not neurotic at all, and this happiness augmented the mana of the voice. But the ecstasy could not last forever. It died out little by little in ordinary everyday life. All the more so as the future father of that child of genius failed to appear. Gradually, she found herself back in the state of being an ordinary girl, and she took this to be defeat. Her shyness increased more and more. She felt ill and miserable, exhausted by inner suspense. Her health was broken. Nevertheless, she managed to keep her head above water for another three years. However, as she was now at an age in which other girls find a husband and get married, nature began to assert itself and drove the unhappy girl into a series of unsuccessful attempts at love affairs. These failures would have been difficult to bear even for a normal young girl and for our patient whose confidence was undermined already, they meant a total breakdown. At the age of 24, she found herself physically ill in hospital and after this came a Freudian analysis. Okay, now this image or this vision is going to transform surprisingly in the next few pages. You know, it sounds like this wonderful vision, but it, it has a dark side to it, too. And we're going to find out what the dark side is. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to, maybe I'll just finish it until we get to the, great, uh, to the great mother's speech, and then we'll start a rotation again. It says, uh, the, the Freudian analyst was a young doctor of 30, only six years her senior. She was 24, so he was 30. He had been married but was divorced and lived alone. He was a nice man and very interested in music. The girl liked him immensely, and what was to be expected happened. She fell in love and wanted to marry him. Circumstances were such that there seemed nothing against a marriage, and their characters might have harmonized, but the analyst preferred another girl whom he then married. He brushed aside the patient's feelings by calling them a mere, let's see now, Sorry, this is a little clumsy, but I don't know how else to do it. I'm learning as I'm going how to push buttons here. Okay, so this is pretty sure. Okay. She developed a father transference, and he did not in the least know how to lead that transference into a development acceptable and bearable for the patient. The best solution might have been to stop the treatment. But the girl was far too fascinated and also too weak in character to leave him. This is uh, not atypical. <laughs> I mean, this happened to me. Uh, it, and the analyst underestimated the patient's feelings for him and continued the analysis before, because he hoped to heal the case. His Freudian method was not entirely without result. Some of the symptoms did vanish and a certain amount of energy was restored. Also, apart from the treatment, the girl matured through the depths of her own love and the sorrows caused by it being unrequited. If the doctor had only shown a bit of feeling and understanding, he might have reached the result he was aiming at. But being a Freudian by conviction, he was totally repressed by the very idea that he might have a countertransference. 
So the two of them regressed together into what we might call a sexual perversion, as we shall see later on. It took the girl 11 years to detach herself from this fascination. So she would have been 35, I think. And that she could uh, part from uh, her love at all was due to the fact that in the end, he really behaved badly and was rude to her. Whereupon anger and hatred rose up in her sufficiently to cause a final rupture. By insulting her womanhood, he had called out her pride, and later she always felt thankful for the finality of that. It was the best thing he had done for her. And there's the years between uh, the Freudian and Jungian analysis, so she's 33, it says. The patient was now 33. Her neurosis was naturally by no means healed. Though she determined very humbly to make the best of the remainder of her life, her soul was not at peace. Indeed, she did in some measure make a name for herself in the musical world, but she knew all the time that although the work she achieved consisted of valuable inspirations, it lacked the solid background of regular hard work, which would have been, would, which would have been more than her damaged state of health could stand. The other, more feminine possibility, namely that of finding a good husband getting married, proved to be as remote as ever, and the next best thing, a satisfactory love affair, was equally un, I'm assuming, obtainable, but let me just check real quick. Here. You know what's funny as we read this, all of these things are gonna transform as we read them. I mean, uh, what, what we're thinking now is one thing, later is gonna be another. So it was unobtainable. And there existed a sexual taboo, which was not cured by Freudian analysis. Apart from this, further forces showed themselves to be at work in her, forces that seemed to lead in unknown directions. For each time, an important musical success or a satisfactory love affair appeared to be within her grasp, something from outside, such as the suicide of her sister, the outbreak of war, the death of a partner, place itself in the way of real, realization and prove to her to be insurmountable, insurmountable obstacle. Obviously, a concrete fulfillment was not permitted in her case. This, this psychological fact became evident to her and she struggled through life as well as she could. So now the Calvary is going to come. Did you want to uh, read this, Charles? The next, you could read the next couple pages. Maybe we can. Uh, sure. Take two pages at a time. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. First years of Jungian analysis. 18 years later, at the age of 51, she saw Professor Young about her problems and acting on his advice, started analysis with one of his prominent pupils, a woman, and su subsequently with two other analysts, also women. Professor Young himself supervised the course of their analysis. It was enormously difficult to get the genuine data because the inner figure which had kept the patient going more or less during all those terribly difficult years was in fact the animus. This animus was able to exert such an influence on the patient because of the possibilities which he opened for her in her musical work. As we know, Jung had, had named the masculine part of a woman's psychology the animus. As long as a woman is unconscious of this figure in her psyche, he is too powerful a master, able to fascinate her even so far as to gain complete possession of her. In the case of this patient, the animus was an ambivalent figure, and the fascination which he exercised upon her, helpful as well as destructive, was an almost complete one. Although his musical inspirations did not bring about a true solution for her problem, namely what she should do with the rest of her life, they often and very helpfully did mean a temporary way out of crisis and despair. When the weight of her problems made her feel desperate, the animus and his music seemed to be her only support. Therefore, she did not dare to displease him by becoming conscious of some other role which he might possibly be playing in her life. She, in fact, could not, uh, for she was afraid of... Get to the next one here. 
Um, you know, I, as many times as I've, as I've read this, it, I never, I'm always um, on the edge of my seat. You know, it's a, it is a, uh, it's, it's a very dramatic story. Okay. I think that, yeah, that's the next page. Uh, going Great mad if she would go. Going mad if she did. And from this great fear of hers, we may well conclude that the other role the animus was playing in her unconscious might be a very negative one. Consequently, it was by no means an easy task in her analysis for her to look this overwhelming personality in the face. Another inner figure, the shadow, the dark counterpart of the conscious ego, was almost totally repulsed by the willful, proud, and conceited character of the patient. As Jung explains to us, it is extremely important that we should be as conscious as possible of our shadow, or if animus or anima and shadow are both unconscious, then the ego fights an unequal battle against two opponents and is probably not strong enough to win. In the case of this patient, these two, animus and shadow, had long ago, so to speak, got married in the unconscious and were now inseparable. They committed all sorts of sins against the patient, who at the time was unable to reach a true insight into her own problems or troubles. But she was persistent and tenacious. She did not give up analysis. Her analyst advised her to try active imagination. She then made spontaneous drawings. Several of them were very interesting, and she liked doing this. It fascinated her. Nevertheless, these drawings did not bring any genuine change for the better. A certain point in the depths of her soul stayed untouched, as yet she did not see this point. The patient made a summary after every analytical hour. Consequently, she would survey the whole of the treatment later on. When she reread her notes, it struck her... Oh, sorry about the kids in the background. No problem. If you hear that. Yeah, when she reread her notes, <laughs> sorry, it struck her how uh, favorable the dreams and her interpretations look. At the same, uh, at the same could actually be said of the whole treatment. And this early stage of her analysis seemed successful, but somehow she never profited by it. Her animus was in the habit of running away with every favorable result before the patient had integrated it and he always impressed her with his opinions. He was too powerful a figure to be resisted. However, in spite of despair, she did not give in to him completely. The Jungian method had impressed her even more than the objections made by the animus, so she kept on. One day she took up with her analyst the episode of the vision, which had occurred in her youth, the voice in the message. Concerning the part of it, her future female destiny, the analyst suggested that the whole of the idea might be a staggering. Okay, now this is, this is getting really interesting now, I'll tell you. Because they're getting to the bottom of the case here, what's going wrong. For, you know, 51 years, by the way. Okay. The problem was the Oh, staggering animus opinion. Yes. Well, Joe, why don't you just finish that paragraph? Okay, okay. She pointed out to the patient that an animus can be a very bad advisor in feminine love matters, that in fact the word love did not appear at all in the message of the mysterious voice, and how utterly unfeminine the contents of that message really were. So unfeminine, in fact, that they could hardly be attributed to any other figure but that of the animus. This interpretation clicked with the patient. I didn't. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want me to finish here? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. He says, uh, th this interpretation clicked with the patient and did at last really change her attitude to the authority of the voice in her vision. I'm glad you have such wonderful kids, Charles. It broke the spell of the vision that was dominating her. To consider the remarks of the voice as animus opinions, remember it told her, no, um, if you experience pleasure <laughs> during coitus, that you're not going to have the genius child. You know, it's just like, 
no feelings. You can't experience any feelings. It has to be totally thinking function. Uh, you know, it broke the spell. To consider the remarks of the voice as the animus opinions was for the moment a lifesaver that reduced the power uh, which the animus had over her, over her. She almost went as far as to wipe out the whole matter and she felt, felt very much relieved at doing so. Did you want to read a couple pages, Tim? Then or, or not? You're a very good reader. Sure. Yeah. At a, much, at a much later stage, the religious shading of the vision had to be restored. For looked at from a higher level, the manna and the authority of the voice appeared to be justified. But in lower or more primitive regions of the mind, they were utterly misplaced and when taken literally, came dangerously close to insanity. For some time to come, the patient was not a bit on that higher level. And the first and most urgent thing to do was most certainly to get rid of her compelling and devastating animus idea. The analyst then advised her to break contact with that animus as completely as she could because he was really treating her, the patient, too badly. The analyst further suggested it would be better if the patient were to try an approach to some positive female archetype, as for instance, the great mother. She was alluding to the figure which Jungians usually call the Chthonic mother, but the patient, not knowing anything about this figure, evoked her own personal great mother, as we shall see. She was profoundly impressed by the suggestion of her analyst and following her advice, which worked out very favorably because she had a highly positive mother complex. Her mother's premature death had actually come about before she had ever criticized that dearly loved being. And the aura of holiness surrounding death made the human mother an almost archetypal figure, wise, loving, and reliable. It was but a little step for the patient to have a positive mother transference to the real archetypal mother figure contained in the collective unconscious. Moreover, this transference was helped and sustained by the patient's growing love for her motherly. And now I'll get the next one here. For Emma Young is who she's talking about here. That is her analyst. Let's see here. Uh, you, you know, do, do you feel, I don't know if you feel it, but. I mean, I'm feeling like I'm really there. You know, I mean, I can feel the healing. So for her motherly analyst, with whom she had a particularly close contact. As a consequence, she came to attribute the archetypal great mother, the authority, wisdom, and power of the self, that most commanding figure, which stands as a symbol for the totality of all the psychic entities. Thus equipped, our patient's great mother might temporarily be looked upon as a suitable female parallel to God, a substitute more easily reached in conversations than would have been a masculine God, because this patient had a negative father complex as well as a dangerous, unreliable animus. When her analyst made this clear to her, the patient did not reject it, but she continued to call her inner advisor great mother, just in order to feel nearer to her. Otherwise, she could not have approached the self with such an open-mindedness and daring. And here, this is the capitalist self, right? This is the... Uh, yeah, that the self is the... Um, is the, uh, uh, the, the... The God image? Yeah, it's the orienting. Uh, whenever it's capitalized, it means the... Uh, it's the orienting archetype of wholeness that's trying to unite the inner and outer worlds. You know, I mean, it's trying to make the unconscious as conscious in our consciousness as our consciousness is. That's the, that means our tree has leaves on both sides of it. That's not, that's what undivided means. So you make the, the unconscious as conscious in your, that's what uh, Ed, Edward Eniger said, the answer to Job is, the pleroma must become conscious in man. So go, go on, Tim. Now that the case has been introduced at some length, we're coming to the point. 
we shall now try to reach an insight into the inner growth or individuation resulting from the conversations which the patient had with her great mother. After each conversation, we shall consider the reactions of the animus, insofar as we can know them, paying particular attention to the more or less clearly visible influence which both the great, great mother and the animus had on the patient. It's important to notice how the voice of the animus, at first so dominating, is silenced bit by bit, and how this powerful ruler comes down from his elevated post in the end and begins to develop into a more positive, in fact, a most potent force. This evolution of what first appears to, to be a very negative animus goes together and is identical with the healing process in the soul of the patient. As her, individual, as her individuation was a slow and detailed process, the material had to be considerably shortened before it could be presented. Actually, the main points were chosen while details of, the perhaps, of perhaps lesser importance had to be omitted. Well, now that um, Miles is so lucky, he got to read The Great Vision. Now he gets to read the, the first conversation of The Great Mother. Uh, which, which maybe we'll um, stop there and and discuss a little bit, but I, I mean I don't I, I just want everybody to I mean I don't know if you are feeling this is like I feel it, but uh, this really is a healing document, you know it really is. I, I think this is uh, the uh, we can skip the next page because it's just an outline, uh, but um, why don't you start uh, there, Charles and I mean, Miles, and we'll just read the, uh, it's, I think it's just two pages long, and then we can uh, just do a little bit of discussion. So you want to do that, Miles? This is her active imagination? Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Part two, initial conversations. The first conversation with the great mother took place soon after that eventful day, mentioned already, when the patient could understand the vision which she had in her youth as an animus idea. She started her contact with the great mother somewhat hesitatingly, as if she still found it difficult to part with her animus, even though by now she clearly had recognized him as her tormentor. She tried to reach a contact with the Great Mother in the following way. Pardon me. First conversation with the Great Mother. Patient. My Great Mother, I want to approach you and to speak to you, but I do not see you very clearly. You are as if under a veil. When I try to remove that veil from you, it then envelopes the animus and makes him invisible to me, which seems dangerous. Why is this? Great mother. Presumably, the animus threw his veil on me the day on which he was unmasked by your analyst. He did this because he has power over you when I remain invisible. Speak with me in spite of my being veiled, and meanwhile, keep an eye on him. Patient, can you help me to educate him? Great mother, we must educate you first. He will follow. Patient, I have inferiority feelings because I am an unmarried woman. I terribly want to make up for my unlived life still. Great mother, in reality it is thus. All life is lived. You lived your neurosis. In the meanwhile, I lived by proxy, the life that was concealed behind your neurosis. You did not know this, and therefore you feel as if you have missed your life. But your life is lived by me. Nothing can fall totally out of the psyche. As soon as you are mature enough to receive your treasure, I shall give it to you. Neurosis is always smaller than that which is hidden behind it. You could not stand that hidden thing, and you repressed it. But you, okay, and then we'll just get on here with the next one. This is very dramatic. I really just this. It just keeps uh, this. It doesn't stop either. Let me see. I got this. I think this is the next one. Hope so. Okay. 
all right, strengthen. Okay, this is the next. Go ahead. Okay. But you strengthened your courage while passively bearing your neurosis for years and years. Compare this to a pair of scales. When courage and strength are gathered and thrown into one of the scales, shall we say into the passive scale? Then the other one, the active scale, can rise. Then you can seize the sum of your unlived life that I lived provisionally for you. Nothing is lost. All of it is there. Try to take it bit by bit. In this way, you will still be able to mature as a woman with a fulfilled life. Patient. But how can I ever be a woman with a fulfilled life if I have not got a normally function sexual, functioning sexuality? Great mother, it is not the sexual function that you should that should be your starting point, but the feelings that possibly can lead in that direction and for which the sexual function might be in the end be an expression. Patient, how can I regain those feelings? I've lost them long ago. Great mother, you repress them. They can be exchanged for courage. Patient, you mentioned courage all the time. I believe courage was not the thing I lacked. Great mother, you certainly have courage, but of a dangerous kind. Your animus plays with your courage, and as you are animus possessed and cannot stand his power, so your courage becomes too passive. Your animus likes to push you into psychic misery. This misery you suffer courageously, very courageously, but only because you see it and is you see in it an opportunity to feel yourself a heroine. This is your compensation for neurotic inferiority sensations. This kind of courage, courage does not function in the right way. It is too passive. Patient, the animus is to blame. Great mother, yes, but ultimately it is you who are responsible for your animus. In younger years, you were far too high up. Therefore, your neurosis was necessary. Now you should not hate shadow and animus so bitterly. Their play with you was monstrous, but necessary. You brought it about yourself by not being in any way conscious of the dark forces in you. Patient, I feel ashamed. Great mother, feel responsible. That should be the way to activate your courage. Okay, then. Do, does anyone have any questions about what the great mother is saying? I mean, as far as, um, there, you, you know, um, she speaks very clearly, but, you know, the unconscious always kind of speaks in riddles. I mean, she talks about the passive scale and the active scale. I mean, she's talking about her living all of this time, you know, uh, passively as far as not being conscious of the dark figures within her and you know the animus was the was the composer of her great vision you know you are uh, not meant to have a vocation you're meant to uh, uh, be someone who produces a genius child but the only way you can produce a genius child is to have sex without any, uh, any feelings of pleasure now this, this, the animus is describing the virgin birth, you know. I mean, um, Craig, yeah. one of the things that I gather is missing, I've never been to analysis, or, uh, so maybe you can comment, but I understand that before an analyst works with an analyst and they have to do a history, like they, uh, they go, they really have to, scrutinize the person's past experiences education and such so what we don't hear are where where she uh, attended uh, for religion let's say or if she did but my my wonder is were some of this uh, whether this programming that she had this animus was it from the business as usual Christianity that she was attending? Well, I think the, actually we'll, we'll find out a little bit about this uh, later. I mean, uh, in the inter introduction, Barbara Hanna says she comes up with some very interesting religious allusions, 
which she said um, were colored by her own beliefs, you know, but, but not to uh, be too alarmed by them. But um, Because, you know, one of the things that was really striking to me, if I might just add where I'm coming from with this, is um, in all of my religious uh, Christianity experience, you know, I'm not saying I'm, you know, I have an extensive religious experience, but, um, but I have enough, I think, to make a, opinions or share my experience. And one of the s- striking things that I was uh, quite dumbfounded to find out recently is that although I think every religious instruction I was ever given, they described the Holy Spirit as he or him. Um, I learned, however, that if you go into the ancient original languages, the pronoun for the Holy Spirit is actually feminine. Yeah, so in other words, um, it's yeah, been she's probably it's, androgyne. She's, she's, I think that's the confusion because she's actually, Holy Spirit is Hermes. You know, well, I guess so, between, or at least, but uh, what I'm saying is that there's, I believe, a kind of a patriarchal animus possession of Christianity. The yeah. so masculine trinity, not a feminine trinity. Uh, yeah, I was, was going to uh, say on the, on the vision, uh, I thought it was really interesting that um, at first I was like, oh, wow, that sounds very kind of, it's just a kind of beautiful message yeah. and thought. And then, and then when the, it goes into analysis and it talks about, I'm like, how, how would I not see that? How would I not realize that it's just this very pure, airy, masculine kind of idea? It's like the notion that you can't have a single speck of dirt touch you. It's the you know? glass mountain. Yeah. The mountain made of glass, which she's going to be trapped in so that she is isolated from the feeling function. And instead of being, uh, she's, so she's being, so, so the, her animus is rink rank, the red bearded one with the, whose terrific flow of talk falls out of his beard. And he's got her trapped in the, in the magic or the glass mountain by her great vision, which he came up with. You know, I, I, I wanted to just take, take a sneak peek at the next page because uh, I'm a little curious here. Okay, uh, yeah. Let's see, when the patient read the conversation to her analyst, the latter showed herself very much impressed. She was warmly encouraged. The patient continued her dialogue with the great mother, which the patient did enthusiastically over long periods. Her animus, however, who loved his power over her very dearly and who did not in the least intend to re- relinquish it, did not miss a single chance of telling her how black things looked, how superfluous her efforts were, and how even how injurious similar conversations were to her health. Patient and animus got involved in tedious and exhausting battle, of which some of the details won't be given here. Well, we'll we'll, we'll continue this next time. But um, that that what you said, Charles, is perfectly true. That. Um, the jujitsu that's done on some of these things are is unbelievable, you know uh, how it transforms and how how that she's going to go more into her father father relationship with her father and Miles, you're going to get a big dose of religion here pretty soon, and it's going to be a an an a, a a religious vision what's going to be that's going to be illuminating to all of us. Seriously, I mean, this whole thing, I mean, I, I don't know if, if you felt the, uh, the, the emotions I did as you were reading, and as I say, it's much different to listen to this when you're reading it out loud. It, it really, do you feel a sense of healing as this moves forward? I mean, just a little bit. I mean, it, it's kind I'm of- I'm just, I, I guess, I'm just kind of like blown away that it's not a fiction. It sounds like too incredible to believe you know and then i don't know it uh, when especially during the dialogue just kind of like i had the thought and kind of re-realization was like oh yeah this great mother like is the unconscious like this is not you know this is not fantasy this is not make-believe it's like this is an entity that she's speaking with and it it's it's almost like too much for me to even process right now 
Barbara Hanna says there is no way any human being could say things that the great mother says because they're going to have the same quality as, as Philemon or uh, Elijah or, I mean, these are going to be things that are so surprising. And what, what Ed, Edward Edinger says uh, about his active imaginations, and I discovered it myself, is everyone has the quality of revelation. It has the, you will, if, if you don't experience revelation in your 20 or 30 minutes, then you're not doing it correctly because the, you're, the voice of the great mother is going to say things that are so foreign to your attitude that it's in, incredible. Like, uh, I mean, it, it, and, and, uh, and what also Barbara Hanna says is you're, you're, you're going to know this is not fantasy. See what fantasy is, is um, the ego uh, saying, boy, if I won the lottery, I could do this. Or wouldn't it be great if I was the boss and stuff like that. But in ima the imaginal world, and remember it means to magnify, to expand our consciousness, is the unfolding of, of the seed that's within us. This is, this is the blooming of the flower. So when it says magnified, that's what it, the imaginal world is. It is the blooming of that unconscious seed inside of us. And it, it has nothing to do with fantasies. I mean, fantasies are ego productions. So anyway, um, does anybody, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess we'll just pick it up next time uh, at this, but um, I think- oh, I'll, just, uh, I'll yeah. just quickly add, you know, um, the, the great mother concept is not one that I heard in the churches I attended. No. And we've talked and exchanged a little bit, uh, I think all of us and Tim and myself, about how males are lacking, um, you know, uh, what's the, the word, the ceremony of, of uh, initiation, initiation into becoming a true man, you know, or, or a, a man um, that under, at least is given some instruction about Initiated in the men's women. group. The men have, would have a myth in the group, and you'd be initiated into the men's group. There is no, and that's why I think you see tattooing and piercing, and we want to belong to something. Well, I'm just saying that I don't think that business as usual Christianity that I experienced uh, provided any um, real deep understanding that there's a great mother that we need to respect. And, and so um, maybe for quite a while, you know, I was this puer or, you know, some floundering male who, um, you know, found women very um because i had two brothers i never had a sister and i think you know maybe that kind of had me inhibited or um, uneasy or uh, no confidence kind of thing for a long time and uh, and and because you know um i don't know there's just no rites of passage for men and i would say in christianity is business as usual that says hey there's a great mother that you have to respect and that the women, the womb men, are are you know going to be talked to by the great mother and 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 how many of them actually have that enunciation? But you know they're really they really want to be the source of the the next genius, you know, the next Jesus Christ. Um, that there's something that the great mother is always telling them initially, but then that gets repressed or overwhelmed by animus. I think this is what you're going to find in Jungian psychology. The great mother is rooted to the earth. You know, she never leaves the earth. The masculine God is not rooted to the earth. It has no roots. You know, it's all light, you know. And so, uh, you know, like I had this, uh, this dream here that um that down by the river was a woman who was a, a an ancient woman who lived in a log and she was the master of woodpeckers 
Now, what are woodpeckers? Woodpeckers are the spirit of the trees, of rooted life. So the great mother has a spirit too, but her spirit, the woodpeckers, never stray far from the rooted earth. You know, they, 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 have, a, they have a, it's called the lumen natura, you know, the light of nature. Uh, but, but really, I, I don't think that anyone, I, I really do think, uh, first of all, the great mother is the source of all the images of dreams, not, not the father. So every time you have a dream or an image that you want to discuss in an act of imagination, you're discussing an image that comes from the great mother. The great mother is water. All bodies of water are the great mother. Um, she's, she's the uh, Chthonic, what they said, they could talk about the Chthonic mother. That's the, the mother of the underworld, you know, and this is the one that the, um, uh, the cave painters would um, uh, worship in the caves. But uh, we're not going to, you're, you're not going to be able, and that's why I say when Peter Kingsley says that the young in psychology is the art of listening to the voice of God within us. The voice of God is not Yahweh, not the Christian God. This is the, this is the great mother, really. But anyway, um, uh, I, you're, you're gonna find out a lot about this, Miles, so have I, and so will I. I mean, this is a, a thing. But uh, anyway, did you, do you, we'll just pick this up next time. It's, it's gonna take a few sessions, but I think it's rewarding. You know, so, um, and, and I think the, the, the point of this is, this is a case history, which has applications to our own real lives uh, and finding our meaning that John Verveke speaks of. So anybody have any sum up thoughts? Sorry I got you up so early, Tim. <laughs> well, I've, I've been suffering from a toothache for, oh, no. for a week. That's and perfect. so I'm not getting any sleep. Oh, well. So, I, I, I kind of the same way. I get up like about three o'clock in the morning just so I can read. My wife says, says, why do you get up at three o'clock? I said, I look forward to it. So <laughs> anyway, so we'll just pick it up next time. And thank you all for uh, coming and uh, we'll keep learning. All right. See you next time. See you all. Okay, all right. bye now. Bye. It's not a touch screen. There we go.